Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. With me uh, today is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, Rob, how are you? Stephen, hello. All right. Well, it's good to talk to you. And um, we have a guest. I'm very excited. I'm going to learn a whole bunch of new stuff today because this is a space I don't know much about. And we have uh, Oliver Gould, who's the CTO of Buoyant. Oliver, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, we're excited to have you here. And before we start jumping into all the tech, it's always good to take, a, take about a minute or so and tell no, us a no, little about No, no, tech your... first. Oh, sorry. Tech first. <laughs> no, we, need to, we need to meet Oliver so we all, we all feel comfortable and then, and then we can criticize his technology decisions later. So, uh, <laughs> Oliver, go ahead and uh, give us a brief background. Oh, fair enough. Um, so, uh, let's see. I, I'm a, an ops person by training and a developer by need. Um, uh, my background is in production operations at places like Yahoo. Uh, I started at Yahoo and saw millions of very, very different machines and worked on configuration management there for a few years. Uh, and then after that, went to Twitter. Uh, very early in their microservice transition. And I got a front row seat to see uh, all the things that go wrong and right uh, with actual microservices. And so um, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I started Buoyant with my partner, William, to really focus on bringing those lessons to the rest of the world and making that uh, change in technology for the better, you know? So wait, you're, you're telling us that adding microservices doesn't automatically fix people's problems? <laughs> well, it fixes some of them, but introduces a hundred <laughs> new ones. Yeah. So, um, repeat, you want to define what a microservice is for, for the, the three people listening to the podcast who don't know or think oh. they know what a, pod, what a microservice is? Yeah, so I should say when I was at Twitter, I had never heard that term. Um, I heard that from a venture capitalist when I was leaving. It's like, oh, you do microservices. <laughs> like, oh, no, I, I called it SOA. Um, but uh, I think it's basically the same thing, right? When we talk about microservices, we talk about putting APIs on processes and uh, giving, I, I kind of see it as a marriage of SOA and DevOps, you know? <laughs> So does that mean that you believe a, a microservices includes the provisioning management sort of pipeline for it? I, I, you have to have that provisioning pipeline, I think, to really adopt microservices properly. Uh, where the goal of microservices is to really free teams to own their own schedules and own their own deploys and then own their own provisioning stories independently. Uh, and so having that kind of commoditized or at least behind standardized APIs makes that a lot more approachable for most organizations. I, that, I really like that nuance because service-oriented architecture is just like, I'm running a service, it's an operational endpoint, yay. But if you, if you say, all right, if it's a microservice, now we've got a pipeline behind it, we've got a process, we've got some type of code to production, which also implies some type of versioning and blue-green and all, the, all of that. Yeah, it means you need a platform, the bad P word. Oh, no. no, 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 no. So, so why do you need a platform? I mean, so yeah, there's a process dumping your, your, your microservice out there. Why do you need a platform? Uh, really, I mean, it's about separating responsibility, right? And so when we, when we adopt microservices, we say this team can own this bit of logic behind these APIs. And we really want to embrace that down at the operational level and give different operators control and have service interfaces over their domains. And so asking for hardware shouldn't necessarily be a ticket, it should be an API call. Uh, and you know, deploying software shouldn't be a bunch of commands I have to go run, it should be some API calls. And so I, I think that once you really adopt microservices, you get pushed into that uh, culture. So, and pushed is exactly the right word, right? You're pushing the microservices too into the environment, right? They're, they're being yeah. driven based on some type of change infrastructure, which is where the platform comes in, right? So you, you can't yeah. just turn, you know, have an operator run around on a, on a Friday night um, patching individual services in that model, right? We're talking about much faster continuous deployment type infrastructures. So something is going to have to take that code all the way through its life cycle. Do you have have preferences on what that platform looks like? Um, I mean, I, I think over time we're really seeing Kubernetes be the, the kind of de facto building block there. Um, it's providing much more of the API surface area to build around than we've had previously. Um, obviously organizations, you know, uh, all adopt their own kind of version of that platform uh, that really fits best internally. And one of the things I've learned most 
being out, outside of uh, Twitter now and seeing how technology actually gets adopted is that there are very, very few pure greenfield environments. Uh, and almost always we need to have processes that deal with the legacy stuff while we still shoot for that perfect future that we you know, may never get at actually de deploying. Right, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so, I mean, you said, you said the K word, um, Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, so do you wanna, do you define Kubernetes from a service, service endpoint or a microservices perspective? How, how, how do you explain Kubernetes? Uh, so I suspect your definition might be, might be more services influenced than, than other people's. Yeah, so I really view Kubernetes as, um, compute as a service or, or memory as a service, right? Uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, I, I might get memory as a service via memcache or storage as a service via MySQL or Cassandra. Uh, but what I want out of a platform like Kubernetes is the ability to say, I want to run something and I, I don't ha and here are my constraints on that running. And so I just want to have the ability to launch processes in my data center and get them listening on a socket so that I can route traffic to them. And that's really what I want from that platform is to get my processes up, listening, ready to do traffic, uh, connected. And then there's an element of when I need to fix that process or change it, I need a, that, there's a control element in Kubernetes that lets you say, hey, this process, here's the new version of this process, start making a change for it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we have, you know, Kubernetes does things around uh, authentication of who can actually do that change. Is that change audited? Um, they, they, so there's a lot more primitives than just those operational things, but we also have the kind of business facing things that we need to actually implement to, to do this safely. Makes sense. So, so we got a trail of breadcrumbs. There's a huge but, right, coming up right now, because I'm about to ask you what Buoyant does and yeah. why Buoyant's important in that ecosystem. You, is there something else you want to tee up from? Yeah. Buoyant? what Kubernetes does before we go dive into Buoyant and, and, and Service Mesh? Well, so I, th I think what Kubernetes allows you to do is really to automate that deploy workflow and automate a lot of those basic operational tasks around process management and scaling things up and down. Uh, but what Kubernetes doesn't really give you any tools to do is manage your application's health from the application's point of view. Uh, so for instance, success rate. Right. If I have a, a service and microservices, we're all dealing with communication. Uh, if some portion of those requests fail for some reason, either logic or because the resources are, are not available. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't really give you any tools for dealing with that class of failure that only exists up in the communication and in the logic of the application. And so what we've been focused on with Buoyant uh, through tools like Linkerd and our, our, our new system conduit is really to give tools that expose the details of the communication and give operators control over the actual communication between their services. So when you say between the services, so you're assuming an application is broken into component units, right? So it's different, different services, different, different aspects of your application have been reversioned. They're completely independent code pieces using a network to link them together. Right. The, the great example is a user service. Almost every application has a, some sort of user's database, and we tend to put the uh, interface around that. Okay, that makes perfect sense, yeah. right? So then you get, you get a token so that you know who this user is, but then all of the other pieces use the token. They don't, they don't go to the database at all. That's exactly then, right. Then you can secure that component, and it's then all the, all the other pieces of your application don't, don't have to worry about users. Right, and if the schema of the user database changes, we don't have to update all the applications. We just have to update that one service uh, to make that change. Right, so now I'm having heart palpitations because if that service is down, my whole application is burned, right? Yeah, and so now we need to have replicas of these things so that we can allow individual instances to fail. Uh, we need to start dealing with things like load balancing to distribute load evenly across that set of replicas. Uh, we have to deal with things like timeouts because the network's inherently lossy and we may, may not actually get a response in the time we want. And we may even have to do things like retries. Uh, but so the, don't I just, go ahead. Don't I just build that into my application? Like when I'm building the app, don't I have to be like, ah, I better build some type of resiliency or is there? Yeah, and so certainly as you get started down this path, you, you do that. And that's what we did at Twitter. We, we built this library called Finagle 
uh, which implemented all this resiliency logic and service discovery and load balance and vis visibility and tracing and all of that. Uh, and then you get, you, you acquire another company and they've written it in PHP <laughs> or you hire some Haskell people and they only want to write Haskell. And how do you get those services online? Uh, the real world is much messier, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so is it possible to abstract that? Yeah, and so that, that's really what we've found that the service mesh is that abstraction. And it's where we okay. bring all of that resilience logic into a proxy. And that proxy can just run alongside your application, your service, uh, and a little sidecar in the same pod. And we proxy traffic for you. And so for HTTP, we know that 500s are probably failures and we can show you success rate based on that failure. And we can do things like load balance more intelligently for you and circuit break when things don't pro aren't connected properly, et cetera. So, so yeah, if you're using standard HTTP RESTful type protocols, then it's not that hard to figure out what's going on, right? And then you yeah. can actually use Use the, use the actual error codes more accurately and get even better behavior from it. Yeah, and so in, in Linkerd- 200, 200, 400. <laughs> yeah, in Linkerd, we know that, okay, if we have a get request and it gets a 500 error, well, we can probably retry that for you for free uh, unless you really don't want us to. And so there's a lot of things that we can just do at the service level, or at the service mesh level without having to get every application to make changes. And that means that eventually that can be a dynamic where now as an operator, I can change these policies without having to change code and do a whole deployment around that change. So does that, I mean, Kubernetes is pretty good at saying, hey, here's a cluster, here's a service that I wanna keep running. Sounds like what you're talking about with service mesh is defining the interactions at a, at a, a higher level of, is it, is it a higher level of abstraction? In that yeah, yeah. So I, I think that uh, Kubernetes really gets you up to the connection level, right? Where I have services and they have ports and through those things I can establish TCP connections. But what we don't have is anything around requests, but around the individual requests of like a get, a post, a 200, a 400, right? Those are all request ideas. A load balancing is even a request oriented thing generally. We wanna send one request to one instance, another request to the other instance in order to balance those things out. And so at the service mesh, we're really focused on the, this request level, what I call layer five, but I think a lot of people call layer seven. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, to fit conduit into that map for us, we have enough, do we have enough of the landscape for, for cause I don't, I don't yeah. quite get what conduit is yet. Okay, so conduit is primarily a control plane and that control plane collects all the telemetry that we care about. So success rate and, and latencies and failure volumes and all of these things. And it configured and it works with a proxy. And so when you uh, deploy your app, app with Conduit, we deploy a, a little proxy next door to it. We use IP tables to route traffic through that proxy instead. And then in that proxy, we can do that recording of status codes. We can do the load balancing that we need to do. And your application doesn't have to change to benefit from any of that. Um, and so just by adding a little configuration into your Kubernetes pod, you get uh, a lot of this ops value for free. So, so let me, let me be, try and be specific and, and make sure that I'm, I'm following the details with this. Because what you're describing, I've heard called a sidecar mm -hmm. uh, container, right? Yeah. So what, we're, what you're saying is your application runs on, um, on a pod. And then inside that pod, you also have another container that has become the traffic cop. Yep. For that. So that's, that's a sidecar. So it, all the requests that are coming into that pod are routed through the sidecar first and then, and then to the application and vice versa for outbound traffic. Yeah, into and outbound, right? And so we'll do uh, a lot of the load balancing makes sense when you're going outbound calling another service. Where inbound, I really care about measuring things properly and understanding exactly what my application is doing. So, I mean, when you're saying load balancing, if you're able to load balance on the outbound call, you're not going to a central load balancer. You're actually doing a distributed load balancer. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. We do client-side load balancing. And so we can actually look at the latencies of individual requests to each endpoint and use that information from the actual request flowing through the system to build a better load balancing profile dynamically. Right, wow, so that means that you're not worried about some, you know, sharing an IP address. Like, lo so most of that load balancers are going to work either by channeling all the traffic to one place, or by having sort of this floating IP address so that you can have multiple multiple endpoints that can then manage that that traffic. Um, right. And so, and so we actually do look in the Kubernetes API to get the set of endpoints to load balance over. 
And so we don't have to go through any centralized system to do that because all of these lookups can just come from Kubernetes directly to the proxies. Okay, so that way the traffic's actually going straight to the endpoint. So it improves resiliency. So when people think, when I think, I won't say, I won't speak for anybody else. When I think about service mesh, sometimes it's easy to think, think of like this layer in front of my cluster that's like the super smart load balancer. But what you're actually describing is, is making traffic routing in the whole in the whole cluster smarter right from a service mesh perspective so you're saying you know what i'm, I'm going to give you some helpful advice about how to get traffic around my network right um, and it doesn't have to be all or one i can do this one service at a time or just a part of a service i don't have to drop to ser adopt a service mesh and my entire cluster to get this value i can just do this in piece by piece hopefully so so we get the resiliency from load balancing plus we get the um, data analytics of actually watching the traffic and saying, okay, this is, this is not doing what I think it's doing. I need to protect it. Right. Um, you, want to find, you want to find circuit breaker um, from that? Yeah. Point? So circuit breaker is basically uh, not sending requests to endpoints that are down. And so if I have a, a big cluster, there's some of those connections might, might uh, break because of a, a rack switch or something like that, or the, the instance might get rescheduled to another node. And we don't want to send a bunch of requests to those down nodes. And uh, by default with like kube proxy, it's easy to have some requests go to down nodes because we don't have that awareness of liveness and application. Kube proxy being the default router that, that Kubernetes uses. That's right. So this, That's right. This, this allows you to get a little bit smarter than that. Yeah. And then the, yeah, because Kubernetes has a lot of information. So are you able to leverage things out of the Kubernetes database to then make better decisions? Right, so Conduit has this control layer above the proxy that's a kind of central, you can think of it very much like the Kubernetes API, right? It's a set of control a plane where you have a CLI that works with it and a UI that works with that. Yeah. Uh, and that control plane talks to the Kubernetes API to store state via in, in CRDs, which are the custom resources that uh, Kubernetes supports, or to look up services or, or to look up, yeah. So we use the actual Kubernetes API as a source of truth for almost all the information that we act on. Wow, and then so does that mean you can add it into an existing cluster? Do you, should, if somebody's gonna say, oh, I'm, I know I'm gonna need a service mesh, do you design that up in the front or can you sort of grow an application and then add service mesh as a, Boy, I'm glad I I'm, I'm glad I, I could do that type of thing. Let's yeah, I, I think it. I mean, I see it most successful when it comes in later. I like it, it doesn't. It shouldn't be a boil the ocean project to get this. You know, start using it. I, so I, what we tend to see is people go to Kubernetes. They realize that some of these operational things are a little bit harder than they expected, and then they start to bring in one solution at a time, and that tends to be very successful. Of course, there are gonna be a bunch of greenfield installations where it makes sense to bring this in early days, but I, you don't have to bring this in before everything else. It should be, uh, we have a, you know, if you go to conduit.io, you can get up and running in like a minute or two in an existing cluster without having to break anything. Wow, okay, that's super fast. Yeah. And so are there, are there telltales that indicate that somebody is like about to cross into, I need, I need a service mesh? Yeah, when, when you can debug things, that, that tends to be it. When, okay. when debugging gets really uh, tricky and you're, you're reaching for more data, when logs aren't really cutting it for you anymore, um, I, I think I really see when incidents get more complicated to debug is when this becomes really important. So how, does, how do you fix debugging with a service mesh? How does that make that better? Well, uh, for one, just by having a uniform level of visibility uh, means that I can ask the same questions of any service regardless of how they're implemented. So I don't have to know whether this is Go or JavaScript or what to debug it. I can look at success rates and latencies and per path information uh, from the service mesh uh, uniformly. Um, in addition, we have a, a new feature in Conduit called TAP, which actually lets us send queries directly to the proxies as they're running and pull requests out to show the user on their terminal. And so we can actually kind of do uh, on-demand debugging uh, because the proxy is built specifically for this use case. Is there, do you tag requests enough that I could like trace a request through a system from that perspective or? Not yet. And so the reason we haven't done this yet is because uh, most of the tracing system require application changes and we mm -hmm. don't want applications to have to change at all to use conduit today. Uh, but I fully expect that we'll support Jaeger or one of the tracing systems uh, in an upcoming release. 
Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you want to, so I guess there's an obvious question in the middle of this. There, there are other service meshes. Is it worth defining, um, you know, comparing a little bit to the, some of the other ones? Or you've, you've been doing Linkerd, that's sort of the, the uh, longest standing, I'll say it that way. Um, some people might have heard of Istio, which is another uh, service mesh alternative. Can you give us some sort of framework to understand that? Yeah, so when we, we started with Linkerd, uh, I think it was announced a little over two years ago. Um, it was, or almost two years ago, it was a very different world then. Kubernetes wasn't quite as mature or stable as it is today. And we built it to work in any number of environments. And really, we built it to stitch together multiple environments at the same time. So I could layer in Zookeeper and console and Kubernetes all at once. Um, and over time, we, we realized that that means that every Linkerd deployment looks entirely different. And so if we ha there's got to be a thousand or one Linkerd. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so really so hard. Snowflaking is a very bad, it's a very hard operational pattern um, yeah. to sustain and avoid. Yeah, and it, it was amazing to see firsthand like how creative people got with their configs in ways that we never really expected. <laughs> Um, uh, we deal with hardware. We see it all. Yeah. Yeah. And the other part of Linkerd is that it was really kind of configuration driven. And so you had to like, the, to get started with it, you had to learn this configuration model and really had to learn a bunch of things just to get going with it. Uh, and, and, and for, you know, we've been tracking Istio as well since the project started and it's a very rich feature set. There's a lot of smart people working on it. Um, I think that they're going to build some really cool stuff, but they're doing a lot at once. And, and I worry that uh, it's a lot for people to adopt. Uh, and I don't think it, this has to be a huge migration or a huge adoption. I think people can get value out of the service mesh very quickly, very easily with a very lightweight touch. And so that's really what we're trying to do in Conduit is not make this a big thing we have to adopt and really have to understand. It, it should be a simple tool that we can use in production next week to start solving problems. Uh, and so that's really where our focus is come to. And I, I think that's a really important thing to understand and for people to think about because, yeah, it, if, if it's going to take you a long time to, you know, and we, we fight this all the time, right? We, we took our version two product, um, we thought was really great when it took two hours to install. And the, <laughs> we got things down to five minutes and then people are like, ah, now I get it. Yeah. Um, if it's if it takes a long time to install that complexity, you know, you're you're bearing the price of the complexity somewhere, um, and it gets sort of tricky. I mean, just like let's look at how long it actually took to get Kubernetes into production in most places, right? This project's been going on for a year or more in, in most places because there's a lot of things that you have to understand in order to solve properly, uh, and I think we can do a lot better for users than that. Right. So yeah, I think that. With Kubernetes, you know, it's it it's more work to adopt than people think. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to get started, but it's not as easy as Docker. Right? right. Docker's amazingly productive out of the gate. It's the thing that just revolutionized technologies that people have been using for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that, there was some concerns that Kubernetes wouldn't sort of become the force that it's become because there's an operational complexity to getting started that something like Swarm didn't force people down. Um, okay. And yet Swarm, it, you, there's, there's a very careful balance with those things. Um, and, and your experiences with Linkerd lead you into understanding that balance better. Yeah, I think what you have to do is focus on the essential things that people have, that they need, right? I, I think if, one of the things we learned with Linkerd is early on we focused on, we didn't really focus on the boring features. Uh, we focused on all the like really fancy features that like I was super excited to develop and I thought were so esoteric and awesome. But like that's all stuff that you have to learn and you have to figure out how to adopt. But the boring features is actually the important ones. Yeah, that's uh, there's I mean that's second system to me, um, yeah. straight up, right? So you're like, oh, I'm gonna fix every one of these things. Yet yeah, we, that was our last our last product and then we sort of when we started with version three for our stuff we put all that on the we're like all right uh, yay it's cool but we'll get let let people add it when they're ready Simple yeah that's right you probably don't need it 
So I, I'm going to pivot us in conversation a little bit um, because this has been super deep, but I want to take us into one of our favorite topics, which is edge. Yeah. If that's all right. Um, because I think that there's an application for service mesh in edge. And so I'm, I'd love to get your take. I don't want you to escape from the podcast without getting your take on, you know, sort of Kubernetes and service mesh, mesh, mesh at the edge <laughs> and how it's helpful or why, you know, why or if it's needed. Um, but before I can ask you that question, I have to ask you to define edge. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I'm going to define edge as everything between my mobile phone and my Kubernetes cluster. Um, okay. Um, and I, and I, I, I actually favor that definition myself. It, my definition is everything that's not cloud. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, yeah. And I, I think, so it's been interesting. I, I've been watching projects like gRPC, which are another kind of communication standard based on HTTP2. And it's interesting to see uh, the beginnings of things like gRPC coming into the browser and actually coming onto the client side uh, of applications. Um, and that's really made me think about that there is a world where we actually have to solve service mesh problems down onto the mobile phone down onto the browser, because we have to do those, like when I'm debugging a user problem, I don't get to just stop at my Kubernetes cluster and say, oh, the problem's not in the Kubernetes cluster, the user doesn't have a problem. Like we actually need the same set of tools that extend all the way to the edge to actually manage incidents and to manage an application properly. So, so what about the, this idea of having like a mini data center or actual infrastructure. So it's like not my, my, so my Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, yay, that's running. It's doing this huge workload. It's running most of my services. But then I show up and I say, you know what? I, I need to get lower latency back into my, my device. And to do that, I'm going to run, a, you know, a, maybe a kube cluster or I'm going to run some services or something down at the edge, right? but yet my, so my application is in the cloud and in this, this data center and running on the edge device. I, do you agree with that as a likely scenario? What's I mean, there are, there are certainly a number of companies uh, tackling the different angles. I know that Azure, for instance, has a lot of pop presence, which gets people much closer to the edge. At Twitter in production, you know, we ended up doing a, a pop thing where we got things onto our network and, and into our mesh basically from the, as far on the edge as we could. And that really did help reliability, especially in places like South America. So, um, so let me, so pop is point of presence. Yes. I and agree. so what you're saying is that Twitter actually built components of the service that people would interact with that were much closer to the end user. Yeah. Um, at least to get us onto our managed communication platform. Right. So, for, so at that point, we're deciding which data center you go to and all of that is all decided as close to the phone as possible. Okay, so did that mean that you had to deploy infrastructure actually in the field in a, in a, tel in a telephone CLAC or a... Yeah, I, I wasn't uh, firsthand involved with that, but yes, we would rack hardware, get it to telcos to run in, in their uh, in location, just like Netflix does and you know, any of these other uh, big consumer companies. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And then from a service mesh perspective, if you've got some things that are local and some things that are in the data center, can you build a single mesh? Uh, do, do, those, do those components have to interact? I, I think ultimately, yes, right? Ultimately, as, as my operations team needs to support all of this uh, holistically, I need to be able to make sure that policy makes sense end to end. And if I have timeouts and latencies, they understand the latencies and distances between my data center and the phone, for instance. And so I think we need to build a lot more of that smarts, but it's hard to do because there's not a lot of standards once you get past the edge of the cloud, right? Right. So, but I mean, I'm, I'm thinking sort of the scenario where the service mesh, you're interacting with the service mesh in your, in your you know, from your phone to the, your, your, your pop, you know, one hop, one or two hops, low latency and the service mesh says, okay, I don't have any running copies of this service close to me. I got a route to Virginia, you know, yeah. you know Virginia one, US, US uh, North, whatever. And then um, 
ah, and then it says, wow, the latency for this is really bad, or right, it's going to cost us a lot because of the ingress, you're, you're doing something expensive. And then, you know, would the service mesh say, oh, we need to put new instances, spin up some, some local copies of the service? I, I mean, I certainly think the service mesh would be the data source for that information. I don't know what makes that decision isn't built yet, right? We don't have that kind of automated uh, auto scaler thing yet. And I think it's very hard to do in a generic application agnostic way. Uh, but what you're describing here, I think basically is, you know, the vision is serverless that people say, uh, oh. where, where, and it, honestly, this is why we, we called Linkerd uh, a linker, uh, because I view this as a loading problem, right? And so Linker is connecting these things. And the other side of that is loader of, let me go provision this thing as, as I need it. Sure. And that, that you know, relates just to like compiling a program. We have a linker and a loader. And now we have this at the cloud infrastructure level as well. So do you see containers like converging with serverless from that perspective? I mean, I, I certainly think they're a big underpinning of that. I expect any real serverless platform that we end up with is going to be basically containerized infrastructure underneath. Uh, in my mind, serverless, I mean, probably means a thousand things to, to 500 people right now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's about building the smallest unit of shippable code and making that easy to provision and tear down. Right. Makes a lot of sense. I, I'm trying to think of, you know, I'm thinking through my our edge infrastructure. I'm thinking through the service mesh piece. It, it sounds like, boy, managing the latency, managing all the pieces moving around. Yeah, it's not. We're not done yet. We're, we're still working on one one cl one cluster at a time, right? Oh yeah, that for sure. I mean, I um, my my peers are probably going to get stressed that I say this, but I've been saying <laughs> that we can put our proxy in the browser eventually. Um, you know, we, we have a proxy written in Rust and, and going to, to WebASM or something huh. is not out of the realm of possibility for the future. Um, so if you had the proxy in a browser, then yeah, you'd be able to push a routing table back into the, um, into the application or well into your proxy sidecar. Yeah, and at that point you can really start to get very detailed per user policies and things like that, which are, are a bit more difficult to do otherwise. Wow, that would be crazy though, because then, so I, I hadn't thought about the sidecars quite the way you're describing it, right? So I, I've thought of sidecars as, as sort of this filter, but the way you're describing sidecars from a service mesh perspective really means that I'm creating resilience for that service and its ability to connect up with other services. Yeah, it's, um, it's like a network library. Outbound. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. And so that way, if that, that sidecar really protects me from having, you know, having to consult with a broader internet, I can make much more local decisions. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then, so when I, so putting that back into an edge perspective, uh, if it's happening on my browser or if it's happening at an edge device that that edge becomes much more autonomous because it's saying, okay, I can work locally. I can go back to my big data center. I can call for help. Yeah. Um, Oh, and then the data you're collecting basically allows you to have those calls for help. Yeah, it lets things collude a lot better, right? I have this whole layer of the stack where things can make decisions without the application having to be totally bought into this. So, and then would you feed in like a uh, blue-green migration? So I have a new version coming down, the, the, the sidecar, the whole, the whole service mesh is actually able to sort of probe through that migration pattern? Yeah, and so we, I mean, already with Linkerd, we, uh, Linkerd today, we see lots of kind of blue-green slow migration uh, use cases, and Conduit will have just, you know that as well. Will develop, um, and that tends to be on the cluster ingress side. So within a cluster, we do those weightings and those migrations. Um, although failover becomes a very interesting intercluster problem, where I can have services in multiple regions, and I need to failover between regions if one region is not available or not able to meet SLA. Which would be layers of service mesh from that perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking towards time and, and sort of wrapping up, but yet it feels to me like there's this, this roadmap. Um, you, I, you've done a lot, but it feels like there's even more in front of you. Is that a fair way to oh, say Oh, yeah, most of it's in front of us, I think. Yeah, we're just getting started. Um, what, what's, what are the exciting, what's exciting in that, in that roadmap? Where do you, you want to see? So I really see uh, Conduit 
unlocking the ability to ask any question of your runtime where uh, at the communication level where we should really not have to formulate all of our questions in advance and put them on a dashboard. I need to be able to ask questions in the middle of an incident and get good answers to them. Uh, the other things I'm especially excited about are uh, things like introducing TLS identity uh, by default for free. And so applications don't have to manage their own security paradigm that we can actually improve this by default automatically for everyone. And then if you have further requirements, we can ratchet those up even further. But I'm really interested in, in raising the water and just making applications better by default without having to make any change, any configuration, uh, any mass adoption, right? I think we can do a lot there. So the TLS would be able to basically exchange trust certificates between different applications so that they would be able to use basic uh, cert management uh, authentication between services. Yeah, and I, I don't think that uh, users really have to be in, in tightly involved in that cert provisioning. I think we can do a lot of that automatically. So Oliver, I mean, that's really cool stuff. I mean, it's like there's so much we can do to make things interesting. The TLS piece, I know we've played with TLS with reverse proxy, um, and it was hard, right? We built custom stuff and we sort of were happy with the result, but didn't know how to other people would follow. So this is cool. I think what you're doing helps people write better applications. Uh, and that's a big, that's a big deal. So thank you. Appreciate that. Awesome. So I'll just ask your listeners to go to Conduit.io, give it a try and give us feedback. Uh, we really want to know what people think. And if it's not awesomely usable, let me know and let me know how it could be better. So Oliver, is there, do you have a Twitter address or something that people want to reach out to directly? They could do that. Uh, yeah, we have a run conduit Twitter account. I'm Oleksor, O-L-I-X-Zero-R. Uh, and we have a Slack and uh, a discourse and all, all sorts of ways to get in touch with us. It's like everything. You have more ways to get a hold of you than um, you can possibly keep up and manage. It's Absolutely. Been, it's a bit natural. Well, I, yeah, go ahead, Rob. I, I I was going to say, Oliver, I suspect if, if your Slack is like our Slack, it's some of it's about using the tools and some of it's about doing the job. So, yeah, right. You can't, you're, for you, you can't decouple application architecture. So you, I, I suspect there's a fair bit of that discussion going on too. Oh yeah. I mean, the real world is where this is interesting and on the whiteboard is not all that interesting to me. So <laughs> makes perfect sense. Yeah. For, for the rack end and the digital rebar slacks, we were helping people with ops all the yeah. time. And that's, yeah. It's okay. That's what, what being a community is about. So. Uh, we, we teach a lot of people how to use Kubernetes. I'll put it that way. <laughs> there you go. That sounds Great. like a plan. Well, thanks again, Oliver, for joining us and Rob, good questions today. And for our good listeners, we hope you enjoyed this. Again, we keep, uh, as I always say, we're always looking to bring you interesting guests with different views on a variety of technology. And if there's something you'd like to have us uh, look into, just reach out to Rob or myself. We're happy to uh, follow up. And Rob and Oliver, thanks again, and I look forward to talking again soon. Thanks, Steve.